Uh, good morning. Welcome to workshop 40 at this IGF. And it's called Internet Megatrends' Impact on the Internet's Architecture. This is a session organized by Internet Society together with representatives of the Internet Eng Engineering Task Force. Just to give a small introduction, last year we had a session called Strengthening Cooperation within the context of the IGF. And during that conversation, the IETF was basically invited to tell more about the work that it is doing and explain some more to the broader IGF community. So that is what, is what we are going to do here. We're going to be presenting three case studies that are currently being worked at, at the IETF. And the IGF is com community is invited to learn more about the work currently underway there, but is also invited to reflect on current and future internet protocols and standards as they impact investments, technical deployment, policy decisions, etc. So the question is, why is the work of the IETF of importance to other communities? Internet protocols is what makes the internet work, and without these standards, there is no internet. And most of these standards were developed when internet security was not an issue. Since many protocols have been developed aimed at making the internet more secure and safer for users, but also, as you will see, that there are very many trends and topics going on that actually make a different internet in the near future. So to have a chance at changing the several options that exist, we're going to have a presentation on them. And one of them is to do have a better understanding of the technical work at the IETF and the reasons why this is carried out. This allows other stakeholders to plan better and create policies toward deployment. With us are, on my furthest left, Alyssa Cooper, the current IETF chair, Yari Arco, who is a predecessor, and Maria Inez Nobles. Alyssa is a fellow at Cisco Systems, where she worked on privacy, and her presentation will focus on the rising use of encryption in the Internet's co core protocols. Yari is an expert on Internet architecture with Ericsson Research in Finland, and his contribution is on consolidation. And Ines is at the Internet of Things consultant with over a decade of experience as an IT researcher and cur currently working on a PhD related to IoT group management at the Aalto University in Finland. And her presentation will tackle the work on the shift from device-centric to service-centric networking. All these very technical subjects are carried out with a reason, and the Internet's use is changing fast, and the technical community deals with it with the consequences for us all. So the presentations will come first, and after that we are going to go into a debate with several questions that have been prepared and have been announced basically on, on the website of the IGF. And we thank you all for being present here, and I would like to start with Yari as the first presentation. Thank you. And can we advance the slides? Uh, one more. Still more. Yeah, so I, I will talk about uh, consolidation or the creation of larger and larger entities in the Internet. And that is obviously not something that the ITF as such is working on, but our work is affected by that. And, and sometimes also our work affects the tr uh, this, this and other trends in the ITF. You can go to the next slide, please. So um, if we go back, and, and I, I guess many of us still have this, this notion that the internet is like the ultimate distributed system that, that is sort of um, allowing uh, good things to happen um, and allows equal opportunity for various different entities, uh, individuals, small players, larger players, allows open interfaces. And that is, of course, still true. But at the same time, the internet has, of course, grown up and become a big business. And uh, as part of that, we've seen also the introduction of, of fairly large entities um, in the internet that uh, provide large parts of internet services for, for, the, for the users. And at the same time, we've also seen a trend towards more centralized architecture that instead of like this end-to-end um, -end from, from w one user to another, we have, um, uh, have to go through a centralized entity in, the, in between. And there's many examples of this. Of course, you can, you can all think about that. Um, you know, it, the most obvious examples are the ones that are most visible to end users and, and uh, consumers, like uh, you know, what, what kinds of social media systems or other uh, services you have in the internet. 
but, but you have to understand that it actually goes pretty deep, like on, on many different levels, um, starting from like internet traffic, which is uh, consolidating uh, more and more, or concentrating on a relatively small number of hands. So um, the large uh, internet con co uh, companies, of course, are high up there, as, as well as uh, CDNs and other um, providers like that. You can also think about things like uh, uh, app stores and uh, cloud services and so forth where there's a relatively small number of choices or, or your choices as, as an end user may be somewhat limited. And um, just sort of reflecting on some of these personal experiences in this space at least. So for instance, if you think about social media networks, I mean obviously you have a choice of many, but once you choose a particular one, you may feel that you have to be in that particular one because everybody else is there, um, but you have very little freedom to sort of um, personalize your, your uh, experience or, or dictate what, how you want to use it, but you've been given a particular product and you can't change that much. Uh, email is another example. Obviously, email is a distributed system, uh, works uh, well today, but I've, I've found that it's actually quite difficult, even as an expert technical user, to set up your own services. You have to go, like I, I have an email um, service um, in, in, you know, in a, um, with a set of colleagues in my uh, company, um, but it's, it's actually difficult to manage that even if we know what we're doing because um, larger entities find it easier to, um, to, to be able to uh, provide email services as, as you're not as easily blocked by various kinds of uh, spam blacklists and such, which we sort of constantly are without any, any fault of our own, for instance, and it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to provide services because you, you, you can be treated uh, in any, any fashion as a small entity, but if, if you say Gmail, nobody would in their right mind block them uh, from their um, email service. Next slide, please. So um, obviously the, the growth of the internet and, and sort of it becoming a real, real business, a real thing, and so important for, for all of us has been the key factor in this. And this is kind of like a thing that where the uh, market forces, economics, competition, uh, policies, and technology meets, and the, this, is, this is the end result, or this, these things all affect us. And uh, from our perspective, like we are technologists, like our job is to work on technology and trying to figure out what, what to do next, like what would be a good thing for the internet for us to develop. Um, and you know, in some sense, we're, we're, not, we're not specialists on economics, for instance, or, or you know, competition issues or anything like that. But it's, it's good for us also to understand like what's happening at the internet. I think for all of us, it's good to understand what's happening in the internet and, um, and it may affect our work. So for instance, it might be that, that we see that if we understand the situation in the internet, we might be able to do something. Like if we choose this path on a technological choice, then this will you know, improve the chances of small players versus large players. Next slide, please. Uh, just briefly, I'm gonna talk about uh, some factors leading to consolidation beyond the, the economical ones. Um, obviously, network effects. You go to a particular uh, service because there's lots of other uh, people or other, other entities there. That, that's a value. It provides more value the more people there are in that particular network. So that's, that's kind of clear. But there are also some technical things and fundamental things. For instance, if you want to provide a low latency service, like where you get to you know, some content or some, some uh, thing, um, from you know, different places in the internet very quickly, let's say in 10 milliseconds or whatever the number might be, you have to do it fundamentally on a global scale on different places. You just cannot do it um, because of speed of light otherwise. So that's an example where you have, like if you have to deploy something that has low latency, you have to do it globally and that will take resources, a lot of money. Um, there is obviously the concept of permissionless innovation that the internet is based on. You can come up with your own um, ideas and, and sort of without asking permission from, from anybody, you can, you can uh, pursue those and build the structures that you want. Um, but it also seems that uh, like when you reach a particular level in, in connectivity, when you have this very good connectivity, 
to, to different places, then, then you can actually build sort of closed structures on top of that. So it seems that there's like, the, it's a double-edged sword, permissionless innovation. There's also um, some more specific technical things. One issue that we deal about uh, quite frequently is denial of service attacks, distributed denial of service attacks. And those, like as large entities by its nature, it better equipped to deal with, uh, with an attack like that. Uh, machine learning and AI is another thing where you might actually, uh, like the more data you have, the better algorithms you can, you can actually uh, develop. So that, that's a future thing that hasn't really happened yet, but we'll probably see the effects of that. Next slide, please. So uh, we have some open questions that we could talk about um, through the re rest of the session, and you could provide feedback um, or answers to this, these questions. Um, so, so I guess the, the first one is, do we understand the, these kinds of trends well enough um, to be able to take them into account? Um, do we, for instance, uh, do enough research on this? And I, I would actually claim that we don't. Um, we could ask about the consequences of uh, consolidation. And one of those uh, uh, consequences might be, for instance, that, that you have this asymmetric balance of power that this large entity that dictates how things are and then the small entities say the individual users can't really um, have much say. Um, and then how can we better address those things? Like not just we like the, the engineers or techies, but like we all together, like w what's the forum? Is it the IGF where we can talk about things like this that are crossing techno technical and, and other um, areas. And also specifically for, for the engineers uh, here, what technical tools might actually mitigate the situation there. You could think about some things like you do uh, federated systems, which might help small players get together and uh, build, uh, uh, build a system or, or a service. Um, you could think about things like uh, browsers having tools that you know, are on the, on the side of the users preventing information leakage to the, the various services that they use. And we have many of those things today, but they're not super successful, I would say. And uh, also, it's kind of weird that they're not the default. Um, so I think I'll leave it here and uh, let you, Alisa, continue. Thank you. I think when we can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, when we get into the discussion portion, I think we'll, we'll find uh, lots of places where the trend that I'm going to talk about, encryption, intersects with the one that, that Yari just talked about, um, consolidation. Um, so if we think back to the early days of the internet when many of the core protocols were being developed in the 80s and 90s, um, most of them were uh, standardized in an unencrypted or what we call clear text fashion. Um, some of them also had, were accompanied by versions that were more secure and that um, provided encrypted modes. Uh, but the, the dominant mode of operating um, these protocols was in an unencrypted manner, which meant that any observer on the network would be able to um, access and read the data that was being transmitted um, using these, these protocols. Um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, there started to be more of a push to develop um, more protocols in a secure fashion, and we started to see some of those um, seeing, seeing wider deployment. Um, but even up to this very decade that we're in now, uh, there's a large proportion of traffic on the internet that was being sent unencrypted. In 2013, with the revelations about mass surveillance, uh, a lot of that began to change, and that a uh, set of events really kick-started a huge push within the industry, within the technical community, um, to, to deploy the existing uh, encrypted protocols more widely and to develop new ones that we could, um, that we could get deployed. Now, when I talk about uh, encryption at the protocol level, it's important to realize what that um, achieves from a security and privacy perspective and what it doesn't achieve. Um, so what you get from protocol encryption is uh, confidentiality or privacy protection on the wire um, from, an, uh, from an observer. Uh, the two parties who have the keys at either end uh, should be the only ones who can decrypt the content. 
but that doesn't say anything about what happens to the content at either end. Um, so it doesn't get you uh, protection from compromise or um, sharing of the data by the parties who are authorized uh, to have the encryption keys. Um, so it's, it's a somewhat uh, limited uh, uh, scope of the topic for today, but that's just how we're limited in terms of um, how we design protocols on the internet. So to kind of understand how things have changed and what the implications are um, of, these, of this trend, I'm gonna walk through three different examples today, um, and they all kind of build on each other. Next slide, please. So the first one is HTTP, which is the web protocol that is used between browsers and servers to exchange data. Um, but it's used actually much more widely than just on the web. So lots of mobile applications use HTTP um, to exchange data, and there are many, many other applications on the internet that essentially use HTTP as a means of um, transporting information back and forth. Uh, a, a prior version of HTTP 1.1, which was originally standardized um, in the 1990s, and as a result, uh, over the last several years, people started to realize that it was really in need of an update. And this is a common thing that happens with the design of the internet. Um, you deploy something, it's very exciting at the beginning, it becomes very widespread as HTTP 1.1 did, and you start to realize that there's lots of ways that this thing could, have been imp could be improved, um, and, and lots of fixes that people want to apply to it. For HTTP, that was primarily related to the performance of the protocol. Um, so it had an issue where um, it, it, to be performant, needed to have multiple connections that could be in flight at the same time, so you could exchange more data with the server when you're um, using HTTP in your browser. Um, and we needed to change the design of the protocol in order to um, speed that up, essentially. Um, if you go to the next slide. So this led to the development of a protocol called HTTP2, uh, the new version of HTTP, which was standardized in 2015. And there was a big question that arose in the creation of HTTP2 about whether encryption was going to be mandatory. And for the purpose of HTTP, just based on the way it's architected, this is really a question of whether another protocol was going to be required to be used along with it. And that other protocol is called TLS, the Transport Layer Security uh, Protocol. So this was a big debate uh, within the IETF. People discussed this for a long time. Are we going to mandate that TLS gets used um, every time HTTP2 gets used? And the, the consensus, the rough consensus in the IETF was that we were not going to mandate this. And so if you go and look at the protocol standard, you will not see that it is manda mandated. But it's effectively mandatory because all of the major browsers only support HTTP2 in an encrypted mode. Um, so even though we didn't require it in the, in the protocol standard, um, it has effectively become the way that HTTP2 um, exists on the internet. And so as a result of that development, along with just a greater push to encrypt even HTTP 1.1, which also has an optional use of, of TLS that is supported, um, we've seen a tremendous growth in the, in the proportion of web traffic which is encrypted. If you go back to 2013, something like 30% of Firefox page loads um, were encrypted in, in flight. If you look at that number today, it's 70%, which is a really dramatic increase for just a five-year time span. Um, nothing changes that fast if you look across the whole broad internet. Uh, and so the key insight here was that in developing HTTP2, um, it was aimed at, at improving those, that performance on the web and something that web companies are really, really sensitive to. Um, it turns out that by deploying it with the requirement of TLS, we married the performance gains to the security gains. So we said, okay, if you want to have these performance benefits that HTTP2 is gonna get you, then you're gonna get encryption along with it. Uh, and so even those companies who sought to deploy HTTP2 primarily because they wanted their websites to work faster um, also ended up benefiting everybody um, by adding this encryption uh, to the network stack. Go to the next slide, please. <coughs> So the next example is TLS 1.3, and this is gonna kind of um, genericize this story a little bit further. Um, so TLS is a very commonly used, probably the most commonly used security protocol on the internet, and we just heard about it in the HTTP story. But it also gets used as a, as a security layer for many, many other kinds of applications, including email, um, instant messaging, and, and many others. Uh, and as a result, it can have kind of an even more powerful security impact because it's, an, it's a more generic building block than HTTP itself. With TLS, the previous version, which was 1.2, was published in 2008. Um, and again, in a, in a span of the 10 years from then until now, there were lots of discoveries about things that could be improved with this protocol. In particular, there were a bunch of cryptographic algorithms that were shown to be vulnerable to attacks. 
um, in the last 10 years. And so within the IETF, there was an initiative to update the TLS standard in order to um, deprecate those algorithms, remove them from support in the protocol so that people could move on to um, stronger algorithms that were not subject to those attacks. There was also a strong push to mandate something called perfect forward secrecy. With perfect forward secrecy, uh, there's a different set of keys that are used for each transaction. And as a result, uh, even if one set of keys is compromised, all of the data that was previously encrypted with the, with the keys cannot be compromised just by uh, virtue of having that one set. Um, so this is an, a key feature of TLS 1.3. And lastly, TLS 1.3 also improves performance. Um, so everybody knew that this, the web was going to be a target use case for TLS, um, and we wanted to build on that experience with HTTP and make those connections go even faster. So TLS 1.3 was published uh, just this August of 2018, and it has seen more deployment in three months than TLS 1.3, than 1.2 saw in its first five years. Um, so again, to this point of if we can tie the performance gains to the security gains, um, everybody who deploys TLS 1.3 gets all of those uh, performance benefits in addition to the new crypto algorithms, the perfect forward secrecy, and all the other uh, security benefits um, of the protocol. Uh, next slide, please. So the last example I'm going to talk about is actually a protocol that's currently in development. It's called QUIC. Uh, I don't even think it stands for anything, so I'm not going to uh, expand the acronym. Um, but but you'll, you'll hear a similar thread in, in this story. So uh, in terms of the transport layer, which is the, the layer that QUIC is looking at, um, the protocols that are predominant on, on the internet, TCP and UDP, um, have been there for, for many decades. Uh, and over those decades, we have developed several other transport protocols, none of which have seen uh, any significant deployment whatsoever. And in part, that's because it's very difficult to get these protocols through firewalls. So a lot of firewalls are built such that they can recognize TCP, they can recognize UDP, and they will let them through, and they won't let any other transport protocols through. So this is a key goal in the, in the design of QUIC, is that we want to make it easy to deploy. We want to make sure that it can get through those firewalls, um, no, matter, no matter what else they might be filtering or blocking. Um, and we also don't want to have to require changes to the operating system of every machine on which this protocol is running in order to get it, to de get it deployed. So these are all means to make it easier um, to see wide deployment. Um, in addition to all of those features, QUIC is encrypted. And it's not just encrypted in the same way that HTTP is. It actually encrypts uh, additionally, in addition to the data, it also encrypts the headers. Um, so that's kind of the idea of this picture here. What you could get before with HTTP over TLS was pretty good. You could encrypt the payload um, of, of the transaction so that the data that you're exchanging back and forth um, was protected from observation on the network. Um, but what you couldn't get was, was the encryption of these headers, things like session identifiers, um, congestion window information, other kinds of data that still gets transmitted by TCP um, if you're using a traditional HTTP stack um, that reveals things about the endpoints. Um, it might not reveal the data, but it can still reveal a whole lot about the communication that's happening there. And so with QUIC, what, what we've decided to do is actually roll TLS right into it um, and get rid of the TCP layer. And the UDP headers don't really give very much rich information about what's happening at all. Um, so being built on top of UDP, rolling TLS in, um, and actually having HTTP incorporated as well, um, this gives you a, a generic transport layer protocol um, which encrypts more of the stack than, than really we've ever seen for a protocol that we expect to see very wide deployment. Um, so this, is, this one is still in development. It's hopefully going to have its first version officially published next year. Uh, but for example, Google ha already has f something like 30% of its traffic running over Quick, which is uh, one indication of, of how wide we expect the deployment of this to be. Next, next slide, please. So um, just to sum up and talk a little bit about the implications of this trend, um, the, the sort of strategy in sum is that we've focused on designing features that the market is demanding, in particular um, more performant protocols, and tying those features to mandatory security. So if you want these performance benefits, you're going to get these security benefits too. If you want to get through um, firewalls, you're going to get these security benefits too. Um, and that has yielded essentially dramatic improvements for user privacy and security on the internet. I'm sort of replaying that formula every time we look at a new protocol design. Now, in addition to this, uh, 
this is a shift for network operators who are accustomed to having lots of access to uh, uh, metadata and content in clear text in order to do lots of different things on their networks. So if you think about um, your typical way of measuring performance, if you're a network operator, um, of doing diagnostics and troubleshooting, of doing spam filtering, of doing malware and attack detection, um, of applying quality of service or traffic differentiation um, to, the, to the traffic on your network, a lot of the systems that are in use today that are used for all of those functions uh, totally rely on the notion that they're gonna have clear text access to the entire packet um, every time it, it hits their network interface. And that obviously is changing, has already changed a lot with HTTP and is going to change a lot more with Quick. And so from our perspective, that means there's lots of new engineering problems to solve. There's lots of questions to be answered about how are we going to be able to manage networks in a new world where uh, they are predominantly encrypted. And so we're looking at things like um, malware detection on encrypted streams and you know, novel ways of doing the same things that you can do now in terms of network management and operations um, as you could do when, the, when most of the traffic was unencrypted. Uh, just the last point to tee up some Q&A. Um, there is a potential for interplay with, with consolidation and encryption. Um, so the widespread use of encryption, what it does is it limits the parties who actually have access to the data. So if, so if what you're concerned about is a smaller number of entities with access to a larger amount of data, um, encryption actually uh, forces out a lot of parties who used to be able to observe this data on the network. Um, now whether that necessarily facilitates uh, consolidation or not is maybe something, something to debate, um, but that's kind of the touch point where the two things interact. I'll leave it right there. Thanks. Thank you, Alisa. Thank you. Thank you, Alisa. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Next. Next. Next, next. Yeah, it's not right. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I will talk uh, to you about um, how now the internet is coming from device centric to service centric networking. Next slide, please. Okay, when the internet uh, started, like 40 years ago, uh, there was the trend to connect and host devices or host with resources that are remote. So I need a way to localize, to localize, localize that, uh, that resource uh, through an IP number, right? We all know IP number, so that was the internet. But nowadays, we still use IP, of course, but nowadays with the deployment of the World Wide Web, um, people get a content, retrieve content from the internet independent where it's located. So we have to think how can we model the internet based on services, based on content. Yeah, independent where it's located. So that is the future internet and we have to work on that as well. Next slide, please. And as well, the future internet includes internet of things. What uh, we know it's like a, all kind of device connected, like constrained devices const with constrained resources, like a low power, um, a low memory, and as well in constrained networks, like uh, with high packet flows, uh, as well including not a constrained network and not constrained devices. So uh, nowadays we have uh, at, our, at uh, our home like a smart home a scenario. For example, we, we have like a smart devices and in this case, we see that not only the user communicate with the devices, devices, but as well the devices communicate with other devices. So, for example, if the fridge want to detect with a sensor that is uh, run out of milk, so can order into the supermarket to bring more milk, or the user can program a light bulb to let uh, him know about uh, some event. So we see here that uh, the, uh, the internet or the use that we use to the internet is based on which service we can get from that, independent where it's located, the devices. We don't care, right? We care that we get the functionality running, what we want. So next slide, please. Um, other examples of where the internet as well is based on services for example, in, in, in e-commerce or online shopping, where you have a stateful services, means like a, you need to 
trans transfer between the client and the server some kind of information, especially, especially for security reasons. So uh, we need to detect how build this kind of services uh, in a, a specific uh, um, uh, contains that uh, we can uh, assurance like a privacy and all the aspects to get uh, efficient communication. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for example, this can, we can use like a use case. Uh, there is a trend right now working. Uh, W3C is working in the web of things, means that I can connect, right, uh, devices through the web browser. That is the uh, uh, work going on. And since the deployment of the web bring this kind of services, like thinking about services, now we have like uh, the browsers allows to devices connect between them. So the W3C say, okay, we are going to build an architecture based on kind of services, actually based on a structure called called sync description that is built by properties, action, and events that is composed by a device. So, for example, I describe a device by properties like temperature or actions like turn on, turn off, or events. For example, I want the device alert me when it's overheating at some point. So, uh, this kind of architecture is focused on the service, on the functionality that it provides. Um, the goal of the W3C is connect devices independent of the underlying implementation. So it doesn't care if I connect it between HTTP or co-op, I should be able to talk with the device and I should be able to access to that service or actions that I want. So that architecture is basically built by thing, like I said, a things like a, anything, a resource that you can locate in the internet. Then the things is, the, is uh, described by the thing descriptions, like a set of property, action, and events that you can manipulate uh, with um, operations. Then when you want to connect this kind of structure, when you want to connect your service within, uh, e between independent uh, protocols, you specify the protocol that you, that you want in the binding templates. So if I want to use HTTP or co-op, I add information in my thin description specifying which protocol I want to use. Then the last part of the architecture is like the scripting API where it allows me kind of operation, for example, to expose my thin description, expose my set of properties, action, and events, expose my services. Uh, what can I do? what can I offer? Then as well with the scripting API, I can consume means that I can manipulate uh, the properties, actions, or, or events. So based on that, uh, that is a new trend. So is, we see that they are working on basically um, how we can build the internet based on actions, services, independent, where are located or independent of the under underlying implementation. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, the open questions will be for this topic. Um, how could we model a service topology? How could we do like a resource management? What, what is a resource? A resource is an atomic piece of information that you can manipulate in the internet, right? A temperature value or a service, an operation. And it's very important when we talk about services that we can identify globally, right? We should be able to identify globally a service. So we have to find a way to identify the service, for example, through a URI, right? That we can locate uh, globally um, a resource. As well, uh, of course, all these kind of services are spread in cloud, in the internet, in servers in the internet, and as well uh, in the age, means the gateway between go to the internet. So we have to, have to see how can we um, form our architecture in the way that we can uh, get, for example, catch information in the age. And so we, we, don't, we avoid some kind of congestion to the cloud, to the internet. And uh, as well as very important, well, how we do the forwarding 
of the services if we if we base our our, our architecture based on service id how can we uh, efficiently um, do the the routing on on the services um, of course all these kind of services need an orchestrator an entity that they can manage so we need a manager that can efficiently um, um, manage the kind of uh, service distribution and since the service are finally by user but end user we need to assurance that the security and privacy components are are there uh, we cannot avoid uh, the security is not negotiable so we we need to specify an assurance the security and privacy like components for that thank you thank you all um I've got to introduce myself, which I usually do because I'm so enthusiastic starting the session. Uh, my name is Walter Natwis. I run my own consultancy and I've been invited by the Internet Society to organize and moderate this session for you. I'm being assisted by Paula Real, who is doing the remote moderation. And my first question, is there anybody online at this point? No? There's people online, but there's no question yet. I'm gonna ask. Just ask if there are questions and we'll make sure that they are addressed. Just to get a feel for who is in the room before we are going to go into the questions. Who is here from the technical community? Just raise hands please. That's a fair amount. Who, who is here from government? And who is here from the, from the public side, from the, the, the industry? A few, and from academia. So the technical community is civil society. Sorry, civil society. Thank you very much. Sorry, very. It was here from civil society. Yes. Thank you. And that does show that the technical community is very interested in this topic, but also luckily that there's a lot of interaction possible. Um, what we're going to try to end in the last 15 minutes is to see how can actually, if necessary, when necessary, make sure that the interaction is being taken to the next level and see how that can actually be done. But first we're going to have read some questions on the screen. We'll probably have some questions on the room. I'll start the interaction with asking the three people who presented to ask their main question to the room and see what answers they get and then we'll turn it the other way around so who would like to start i don't necessarily want to start but just want to know i think we have until 1320 so we have 55 minutes right yeah okay um open for questions <laughs> please please ask it Hi, well, what, what do you think about this kind of service-oriented networking? Like, uh, do you see often in your daily routine, kind of use internet, like e-commerce, right? How, what, uh, what do you think should be improved based on your daily routine using those tools? Or you don't, like, realize? Yeah. Please introduce yourself and your affiliation. This is really awkward. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Taylor Bentley. I'm at the, uh, with the Government of Canada. Um, so I love the interplay between these three, th these three mega trends. Um, it's a really great uh, example of the multiple dimensions of all of these issues. Right, consolidation is not this looming. Uh, nefarious presence. It has some uh, massive benefits as far as uh, take up of, of uh, key trends, especially when we are trying to reorient the internet towards the, the more secure direction. And uh, this this service oriented uh, or this more service centric trend is really um, fascinating. So we're doing quite a bit of work on um, Internet of Things, and uh, a big candidate for us. Uh, right from the get-go and, and remains an ongoing focus is, is through MUD, uh, manufacturer usage descriptions. Um, but this is, I mean, a, this is a design problem. 
and, and it's that design problems take many years to fix, um, where it sounds like service problems could be just a matter of a, of a policy update. Um, for instance, in an improved browser that can ultimately provide this um, the service benefit, the functionality of making our devices, when we use them, work better, make them more secure, because we have, I mean, uh, part of making sure they function properly is understanding them, understanding their limits, understanding what they shouldn't be doing. Um, so I guess within my question is, um, how quickly can we fix um, or improve or enhance the security of the Internet of Things using this service-based approach? Thanks. And is convergence the, the secret to this? Thanks. For example, in the ITF, right, for the, uh, for the IoT, because the IoT is something new, and which generate as well as new business models, we didn't have before like a normal devices communicating between them, right? So we have to think like assurance, privacy of the end user of the, that information. And I mean, in the, if, you, if you see the meaning this in the ITF, they say there's still work in progress. I mean, I mean, the ITF is good because it's open to everyone. So if you want to participate, you can do it. <laughs> and, um, and there is like a bunch of group of people working in security. Um, there are protocols like DTLS done for that. Of course, all the information is always encrypted. Every protocol that is developed in the ITF should have uh, its own security considerations. So, I mean, it's still there, uh, work done, but still is like, uh, it's fresh because these new business models bring new issues, security issues as well, so. Yeah, and just to kind of take that up one level, if you sort of look at the way, at least in the IETF, that we've approached um, IoT standardization, it is to take protocols that we know well, that we have lots of tooling around, that people are already accustomed to using in their software stacks, and just adapt them to environments where the network is constrained or the processing power is constrained um, or the devices are constrained in some way. And the theory behind that was to make it easier for these things to get reused um, by having the, the basis for them be very familiar and the, um, the sort of software development ecosystem around them be familiar. Uh, in some cases, that is not incentive enough, as we've seen. So in many cases, you have IoT devices that are, um, you know, they're so cost constrained uh, that the, the cost of deploying even these specialized protocols, which are supposed to be easy to use and configure for these devices, um, it, it looks like too much. And so they're getting deployed without um, even your most basic um, uh, security features in them. Um, now, MUD is, uh, is an interesting example of another train of the standardization and, and engineering effort which is to look at that situation. We know there's, there's insecure devices out there and try to layer on top some other mechanisms that um, network operators and device manufacturers can use um, to detect, to start being able to detect attacks um, or to detect anomalous behavior. And that's what this manufacturer usage descriptions or MUD is all about. So instead of um, trying to attack that at the, at the layer of the protocol that the device is actually gonna use, we assume the device is going to use uh, is, is going to do some things that are wrong and that we're not expecting, and we can use tools like MUD um, to to help uh, find out when that's happening, and then hopefully to mitigate any any potential attacks. Um, I just wanted to highlight one, something else um, that was said because I thought it was very insightful, which is that in some ways the consolidation trends that Yari talked about um, can make it such that you only need a small number of actors to decide to do something good for the internet, and it ends up uh, uh, dramatically improving things for a wide swath of users. Um, so if you go back uh, 10 or 20 years and you had you know, many, many more um, uh, operators and, and content providers who were um, you know, proportionally serving uh, the, the user base, um, if you had to convince all of them to start using TLS, for example, um, that, would, that could take a really long time to reach the, the bulk of the content being served on the web. Um, as these things consolidate, it means that a smaller number of actors can, um, can take a positive step and it can have a big impact. Now, 
if a smaller number of actors take a negative step, it can also have a big impact, and that's why there's, it's sort of this double-edged sword that Yari was talking about. And if I can follow up on that a little bit, so, so first on the, on the IoT space and, and, and security issues, one, one of the difficult uh, issues there is that the IoT is not like one thing, it's like a, you know, 10 million different things, like literally 10 million different applications, and, and, and you can't really, like, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to generalize necessarily, but, 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 but the issue is that, that people do not, not just, like, the, you know, they don't necessarily deploy the greatest uh, technology, but they also do very stupid mistakes, like, you know, default passwords and such. So I think we have to attack it uh, from multiple fronts, and, and one of the fronts is, is to create per better um, devices, for instance, when, when, when you create a product for, for, for the IoT space and, and avoid some, some of these simple mistakes, even if uh, MUD and others, uh, other technologies can, can help somewhat, that's still, still necessary. And the other thing that I wanted to follow up on uh, Alisa's uh, great point about this, like small number of people being able to actually affect um, the internet in, in some, some way, and that's, that, that's certainly true, but the, it's actually quite complicated still. Like the, let's take one very concrete example in, in the ITF we've developed a protocol called DOE, which is uh, DNS over HTTP, and the basic idea of that is that you, instead of DNS protocols, uh, you use HTTPS to access the, the, um, the content, or the, the, um, the DNS content. So you send queries over this protocol, and it's encrypted. And, and it's a great thing. Uh, I mean, it can provide this benefit of limiting the number of parties who can access the, the you, you know whatever you're asking um, the DNS for, but it does have a downside, or you know, the way that it's possibly being deployed. This hasn't, hasn't really happened yet, but we're sort of suspecting it, it. It will happen. So, so one way of deploying it, if you think today, like how you ask queries in the DNS, you you go around like in you know wherever wh whatever network you happen to be, you ask the local DNS uh, resolver server for for information or for the query, and and there's like 10 million different uh, servers in the world or or even more. Uh, in different networks that, that a, uh, answer these questions. So it's very diffi difficult for anybody to get to all of those servers and figure out like what are the people in the world asking DNS uh, uh, about. But um, one way of deploying this kind of technology that it's, it's again, small set of people decide, let's say the browser vendor decides, ah, we're gonna use this DO service, but it's, it's not really available in all of those 10 million different servers, so why don't we just point it to 8888 or 1111 or you know one of these gen general purpose um, resolver services. And suddenly you have a situation where, yes, you've um, encrypted information from the outsiders, but you've uh, centralized information that used to be in 10 million different places in the world into like you know a handful of small um, uh, or small number of entities that are large and who are like I know some of these people personally they are really really good people they manage their networks and, and ser servers perfectly but but still you, you you create this place of extremely valuable information that, that could be asked by the government, so it could be used for commercial purposes. And it's, you know, particularly for the government ones, it's, it's difficult to resist. So, so there are these trade-offs, so it's, it's not entirely trivial how we approach some of these uh, questions. Thank you. I think what all these examples show is that, <coughs> sorry, is that, that how it affects literally all of us, all the devices we run at home, how consolidation actually will affect probably the, the, the sort of services that we have or even the quality of the services that we have. The Internet of Things, actually, we haven't seen the beginning of it yet. So from there, I think the, the question is what you said, Yari, we need to have better, uh, better tools, better Internet-connected devices. But who is the we? And probably a lot of the we are represented in this room. So how do you envision the we getting together, uh, and then I'm going to ask also the room to reflect on how do you see your role in, in, in the topics we are discussing today. So, and then I'll go to the remote question. Thank you. So, who are the we and how do we connect?
Hello, my name is Jacques Beglinger. I'm uh, from the private sector uh, from Switzerland. I will have the honor next week to chair at the Swiss IGF a uh, session on how can we master the transformation. And one of the big questions that I'm asking myself right now is, aren't we too fast with all these developments? So, so to say, technology is trying to bridge things and make things much quicker than the users, the end users, can actually swallow them. Well, it's not actually up to, to the users to, to, uh, to, to make final use of it, but the trust may be gone. So aren't we too fast with technical development? I'm the lucky person who gets to answer that. <laughs> Let me give you my answer in a sentence. No. Um, so I actually, uh, I do think kind of trying to lump all of technology development into, um, into one category makes that question almost impossible to answer. But I do think we can break it down. And so um, I think from the perspective of some of the developments that, at least the, the ones that uh, myself and, and Inez um, talked about today, um, these are like identified uh, engineering challenges that we've known about for decades, um, where people could see in the 1990s that there was a better way of doing this. And if we could just figure out how uh, to do this, then a lot of people would reap the benefits of uh, service-oriented architecture or, um, or you know, the rise of encryption. Uh, because because things were getting attacked and 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 you couldn't compose services very easily and when you roamed from network to network uh, you you had to start all over and there were there were you know serious um, user experience issues and um, and you know attacks against the um, the integrity of the communications and the network that uh, where it was obvious that that we needed to develop some solutions and so from our perspective the fact that it ha in some of these cases took uh, you know 10 years to develop the next version or to get it deployed um, is is not too fast at all right it couldn't it couldn't come fast enough and we feel like we've finally kind of found this rhythm where we've figured out how to embed the incentives of the people who need to deploy the things into the design of the thing itself um, such that uh, once it's finished, everybody looks at it and says, oh yeah, I want that. I want that on my network and it's going to improve the experience that our, my users have um, and the experience of, of everybody else on the network. Um, so that's, in, you know, in terms of like there's some obvious problems uh, to get solved, I think um, it's not moving too fast. It's not moving too quickly. We only can figure out how can we make the process go more quickly. I think in terms of the, you know, the broader set of, uh, okay, that now we del we deliver all this technology to people and there's all these implications, um, I think that's, that's more of a case by case, um, you know, uh, you know, if we could go slower, what would that mean and what would that look like? Um, but for for these, um, you know, sort of harmonizing the architecture and and increasing security, I think it's um, you know mostly a benefit, not a loss, to go to go more quickly. Uh, okay, we have two questions from the same person, which is called Mahmoud. Um, those are addressed to Ines. Uh, um, he asked if, it, if the presentation was about services based on IoT or if you were talking about a new trend of the internet between devices. And he followed up with the question um, about if you have any uh, future view about consciousness, robots, and devices that are permitted to make decisions. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, well, I was talking about service-centered networking, which nowadays include devices as well within them, because it's like the future, but it's present internet. Uh, we have internet of things in our life. I mean, the examples were all IoT devices from the market available now, so you can build your smart home easily nowadays. And as well, there are a lot of uh, IoT systems deployed, like uh, for agriculture, Building smart buildings, smart, smart uh, AMI, uh, like electricity. So it's, uh, there are a lot of IoT work ongoing and deployed. So it's like uh, uh, the, the service, you should think that you are connecting people and you are connecting devices. You cannot avoid and think only in people because no, nowadays the devices are, are with us, right? And this kind of web of things, uh, they try to connect devices between the browser, so it's going to be like 
and they are uh, they are already have uh, open source running code, so it's a matter of time that the products came with that. And then the, the second question was, sorry? Was if you have any uh, ah. future views on robots consciousness and devices that make, can make decisions? Uh, well, yes, uh, the devices can make decisions. Uh, maybe the basic ones, like uh, call the supermarket when I'm a round of milk, or maybe uh, more advanced uh, decisions depends how you program. I mean, nowadays the the the, the devices, the platform that you can program is uh, is not so expensive, so you can easily program intelligent on the devices to do whatever you want. Um, is uh, is available? So yes, I mean, this kind of machine learning uh, orientation the, the, in the ATF as well. There are a working group uh, working on like machine learning for networking. And there is a lot of research in academia done on that, like agent, multi-agents uh, on the web browser level. So yeah, the, the robots in the internet is like a fact, yeah, for me. Thank you. I don't know if I, I answer. <laughs> I hope. Yes, thanks, uh, Matthew shares with ICANN. So these three presentations are really interesting because um, I want to bring the conversation back a little bit. I, I will answer your question, but in a roundabout way, if that's right. I want to bring the question back to, to what Yari was saying about consolidation and um, the impact or potential impact on permissionless innovation and what it might mean for um, future innovation. What's interesting about this service topology is that it's in fact, basically sharing an increasing amount of information and data between devices in a particular captive space, which you illustrated the home, but I would imagine that could be applied to any number of particular spaces. So in my mind, that kind of raises the question that comes back to are we, and it's a general question now, but are we actually through adopting and promoting these kind of services, are we increasing the convenience to the user but at the same time, are we increasing that element of consolidation and the default notion that Yari was talking about in the beginning? How, is this, how does this interplay? And then to, to, to Alyssa's point, is there a role for encryption in, in ensuring that that um, exchange of data and information between all these devices is then lessened so that the opportunity for capture and defaults and things like that and consolidation is lessened. So I'm, that's the kind of, and to your question, I think, so that's the first point. To the question on, on how do we pull ourselves together to address this, I think it's not so much a, an issue of that or an issue of going too fast, but it's more an issue, issue of looking at these technologies more holistically and understanding what the various implications might be. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I think the, w for, for me, one of the key questions is that like, we, we've been able to make, as uh, Alisa explained, a, a lot of progress in, in encrypting connections over the internet. But, um, but to me, the big you know, sort of remaining area that, that we haven't really dealt with so much is data. Um, and what can we do about that? Like, you know, if, if I, like, you know, I can set up my own thing at my own home, and you know, just you know, make sure that my servers are fine. But for most people, the like it, it, it's more convenient, and and there's lots of benefits if if you you use some kind of service or you're part of some service um, wh where you have to disclose some some data uh, or at least some parts of of data. And and being able to protect that data is you know today is essentially you just you know give everything. You know, for free and unprotected, and and so on. And I, I think some progress is needed on that front. That that's one of the next steps. And I, I don't know how to do that. At least not yet. But hopefully someday. Um, so I think you raised kind of an inter a really interesting question around the, the issue of um, of innovation and, and walled gardens. That's sort of what I what I heard in your in your question. Um, and I was thinking about this in the earlier discussion too, because a lot of the the security benefits, ideally, what we'd like to see when they get rolled out on the network is that uh, users don't notice a difference. So people are going to start using this protocol that you already spoke about, DNS over HTTPS, and the hope is that 
people don't notice any difference at all, other than if their DNS traffic was previously being censored and no longer is able to be censored because it's intermingled with the rest of their web traffic. Um, but they shouldn't really have to be involved or have to make some sort of complicated trust decision about which DNS resolver they're gonna configure. I mean, who in here configures their own DNS resolver? You're like, you don't have to raise your hands, right? Right, yeah, you raise your hand, right? Yeah, there's like four people, right? And there's four people in the world, right? So, um, so those are the kinds of decisions that we've like actively been been trying to take out of the hands of users because they're complicated and um, establishing a baseline which is just more secure for everybody um, tends to be a better a better way of getting these things um, out onto the network. At the same time, if that same if that literal same decision is also opting people into more of a walled garden or more of a you know a, an a space where uh, the majority of their data is only getting shared with a smaller number of providers, this raises the question of whether that's a decision that people should be automatically opted into and does it have to be tied in with the, with the security mechanisms. And that's, I think, where, um, where a lot of the, the big challenges are gonna be going forward with this, with this interplay is, um, you know, do you, do you go back and try to give people lots and lots of choice um, knowing that that kind of defeats the purpose of, um, of some of the security features that you're trying to deploy. Um, it's, a, it's a really hard design space, I think. Dmitry Burkov. Hello. Dmitry Burkov. I'm sorry. Uh, yep. Go ahead. No, no, no. Andrew. Please. <laughs> uh, now it's uh, soundless. Okay. Dmitry Burkov, now it's like the, the represent dot Moscow and dot SU. Uh, with, uh, after all these presentations, which uh, draw very simplified walls, I have only one uh, pessimistic conclusion, but obvious uh, uh, future development uh, direction, because you closed the transmission. We have got concentration. It's a new risk. And now it's a key issue. It's uh, how to provide adequate tools for person to manage his personal data on both sides. And uh, especially in such situation with super concentration, which we will have in, 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 in all ways. Because it's obvious that service oriented network will be a service API uh, for smaller players over the elephants. And for me, for me as a person, of course, I can't believe in any IoT things only if my data will be protected on remote side, not li only here. It's how can we, um, without this feature, it's the ability to manage access to data, your data anywhere in the world. It will be a huge problem. Thank you. I'm Andrew Sullivan from the Internet Society. I, I wanted to chase something that um, Alyssa was saying because it, it strikes me that the second part of this, uh, of the title for this, right, was about what these me mega trends do to the Internet architecture. And I think that there's a, a really significant piece here that um, that Dimitri just, just just touched on. In fact, the the, the consequence of this sort of uh, the, the sort of service development and the natural consolidation that maybe comes from that because the services all end up being done over HTTPS and HTTPS maybe tends to concentrate because it, it tends to push the service towards a, 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 server, a server under a single operator means that we have a, a network architecture that cannot or perhaps cannot deliver the end-to-end -end experience the way we originally envisioned this. That is, the services end up being run by other people. They have to be because they're run as services in the network by uh, concentrated server operators. If that is true, then um, then we we are we're potentially creating an internet which has uh, differentiation among nodes built into the architecture and instead of an accidental property of the way we've deployed it. So the way we deploy the internet. In fact, right, the, the theory was all the nodes were, all the hosts were the same, and they could all send uh, TCP to one another. Uh, but of course, that never happened. What actually happened was we had consumer access, and then we had like the real people. Um, and the consumer people were out here at the edge, and they were just consumers. Uh, 
the, the network architecture that is implied, however, by the service orientation and the con consolidation uh, suggests to me that actually that's now a feature of the architecture that cannot be avoided. And you create a class of people who are simply consumers of whatever the network services are. If that's the case, are we still talking about the internet or are we talking about a different kind of network, uh, you know, some new thing that um, uses some of the internet protocols underneath but actually is a consumer network more like the, you know, kind of cable system um, with, uh, with somewhat passive uh, consumption at the edge. I don't know if that's the case but it, it strikes me that there's a drift of this conversation that, that is leading me that way and making me sort of semi-suicidal about it. So uh, <laughs> I thought I would ask the question to see if everybody else gets depressed too. I'm glad you can still laugh about it. So <laughs> otherwise, I would have got some medics for you or something. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think we need to necessarily get uh, depressed. Um, it, it's situation is is um, you know there, there's some challenges, but we we can actually try and fight that in in some way. And step one is that we actually recognize that we are in a situation, and you know whether that's in. Um, a change to the architecture or an attempted change to the architecture, but but at, at least we can think about like how could we go go around that in in in, in some fashion. And one of the things that sort of strikes me, at least in this discussion, in in architectural sense, that, that like we have a very different situation on the lower la layers. That you know we have this IP and and uh, transport protocols and very widely deployed, very widely like everybody anybody can connect to anybody, and that that's no problem today um, and and there's a lot of interoperability but on the higher levels we don't have like we have this closed world so closed uh, universes and um, and there isn't a lot I mean there you, know, you can you can talk to this thing from your browser but you can't necessarily like I can't develop a component that I you know I would use to replace a part of, part of Facebook um, but you know may, maybe that's a direction that we should uh, go into that that'd be sort of opening up some of these um, uh, universally used uh, parts and being able to standardize some of the the, the interfaces and APIs and that might help break up this this log jam a little bit. Just one of those things. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. I think I th I think the um, kind of parade of horribles doesn't necessarily follow in exactly the way that you laid it out um, because because in many of these cases the you know the the service provider who's at the center of this is there in order to connect to endpoints so it's not a peer, it's not like a pure peer to peer exchange although there is like a lot of interest in returning to more pure peer to peer exchange and decentralization um, and uh, you know kind of distributed computing and all of that and that's very interesting and i think it's quite possible that we could just be in, in kind of an upswing of a sort and kind of you know swing back towards the middle. But even if that doesn't happen, um, uh, as Yari said, we are we are looking at components um, and still have a lot of interest and energy in the IETF and elsewhere in um, you know, standardizing technologies that facilitate peer-to-peer -peer exchange of some sort. So you can think about um, WebRTC is one example of this, which is a, a, the new web-based suite of um, real-time protocols that let you make a phone call or a video call through your browser. Um, and those and they're not only being used in the browser, they're also being used in mobile applications like Facebook Messenger and those kinds of things. So, you know, you have Facebook sitting there in the middle um, uh, setting up your call, uh, but then when you call someone, you still connect directly to the other peer. Um, and that's and that's very important to the architecture of, of that protocol. Same thing um, we're doing with messaging layer security, MLS, um, which is for group chat. Um, <laughs> how many people have more than one messaging application on their phone? Yeah, probably lots of people. Um, so, uh, you know, messaging is, is a huge growth area. Um, lots and lots of new entrants and the whole idea there is even though there's a service provider in the middle, you're connecting peers. So um, I think it's easy to kind of fall into the trap that um, uh, you look at the, if you look at the internet from the, um, from the perspective of the, which kind of traffic has the most volume and it's clearly video streaming and, and so we must be optimizing for that. But I think that's, that's only true in, in one sense. The other thing, just to return to Yari's like very good list of, of causes for this, um, it's not all protocol design is not the only cause of consolidation, right? There's like 10 other reasons, um, including you know, economics and network effects and so forth. And, and to the point you raise in particular, um, you know, we may have created this client server mentality, but the, um, 
the disparity between uplink and downlink capacity on most um, uh, uh, residential broadband and um, mobile wireless networks also has contributed significantly to this. So if you wanted you know, to go back to the time when it really was uh, a network of equals, you have to go really, really, really far back, um, uh, if ever, you know, to the point where you were getting the same amount of uplink as downlink. Most people just can't, you know, can't even dream of that. Thank you. Uh, Farzan is speaking. I have a couple of points to make. First of all, uh, about the internet consolidation, I just wanted to know if, uh, so if centralization is necessarily a problem or is this actually a good thing? I mean, it's great to have decentralized networks and uh, that has been like a value for us for a long time, but might, might it be that these values change over the time? And uh, also there is like this, I don't know if it's a rumor or everyone talks about it. So the internet protocols that are being designed by uh, the main industry players are being adopted by them. So uh, there is this, um, perception that those that actually attend IETF are the ones who are, and uh, build these protocols are the ones who are going to uh, adopt them and just this is going to, be, this is how it's going to be dominant. It's not mainly about interoperability. Sorry, this was like a very controversial thing. I just said it, put it out there. Uh, I'm not, I'm, this is just a question. This is not my opinion. And on the second, and on your presentation, I was a little bit confused about what you were asking us. Uh, because we have the policy aspect of uh, things, which is uh, how the Internet of Things can be secure and private, and then uh, also there are multi-stakeholder processes at NTIA that looks at these issues, and then you have the technical aspect. So I guess that your, your questions are not really addressed to the civil society end user person. You're not worried that, uh, you're not asking me if I want to allow my fridge to uh, come to my room and beat me up if I eat something that has a high calorie. Uh, so I don't think these are like the design features that you're asking. And also the predictability of uh, internet architecture, internet protocol, and what sort of effects it's going to have on rights is just not possible. Um, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, of course, when you see the problems, you can solve them, but I don't think you can predict the problems. So on the centralization question, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, if, if there's information that you don't want exposed and you think it's uh, important for you that it, it stays uh, on your, in your control, I think that w w what to do in that situation is to not put it in a central location uh, or, or uh, n perhaps not even let it out of your hands, but certainly not put it in w like one place where anybody in the world can get to r relatively easily by... Uh, uh, government uh, mandate or something um, the the other thing the question about uh, like the you know who uses and and who standardizes things I mean it, it's it's a fair question and and that you know certainly some proposals come from certain uh, sectors of the industry that's natural but it like the ITF is very special in the sense that like we don't standardized protocols because you know we like them or you know some some person like that you know this lo uh, spec looked nice we actually standardized them in order them to be implemented so so a lot of these things that, that Alisa talked about like CLS 1.3 I, I was in some uh, hackathon uh, before the IETF um, so a year or two ago and they had I think 18 different implementations from different parties I think that's remarkable but it's exactly those 18 I may be more than 18 but 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 you want those people adopting things and affecting the th standardization definitely Th that that's not a bug that's a feature yeah um, just to give an example on the question about centralization so there I mean there's definitely benefits and drawbacks um, if you look at DDoS prevention and mitigation um, I think what we've seen is that larger providers, as they gather more customers and more data, they are able to um, better prevent DDoS, and that's part of how they've been centralizing and consolidating. Um, and uh, so 
that might also lead to other drawbacks of it, but there's, it, it comes with, with some kind of benefit. Maybe some people who were trying to access the IGF website this morning noticed that um, they got a notification from Cloudflare, um, uh, one of whose lines of business is to do exactly this, right? Um, and and the, the wider footprint they have, the more, the more, um, uh, the better they get at being able to provide that kind of service to users. So, um, so it's, you know, there's not a simple answer to, to this question about centralization. Um, I think uh, to just build on what Yari said about the IETF, um, it's, it's obviously an open forum and anybody can participate. Um, and it operates on the basis of rough consensus. So if we have uh, you know, a bunch of people who come from a, a small handful of providers and we have a bunch of people who are trying to represent uh, a broader base of users, um, these people need to um, come to some kind of consensus at the end about um, what they want to standardize in order for it to become a standard. Um, now, that doesn't mean there isn't differentiation in terms of uh, who has the resources to be able to participate, because it can be um, resource intensive in terms of taking up a lot of time. Um, so for example, historically, it's been been harder for us to um, have as much participation from some network operators um, because network operators tend to, you know, they, they have a lower margin business. They can't afford to have a bunch of engineers who are looking a little bit um, longer range at the kinds of, you know, future standardization projects that, um, that are of relevance to their company. Uh, and so we do a lot of outreach to try to bring those people in and make sure that their, their perspectives are represented even if they can't, you know, throw 10 engineers at the problem at any given time. Thank you for your question. Uh, about the IoT security, yes, actually it's a lot of layers to consider. I was talking about like, a, yeah, protocol oriented, but uh, yeah, when we talk about IoT security, we talk like a different layers or a stakeholder that should address and should be responsible of the security. For example, the government should say, okay, if, if, we, uh, if this service is available to the community, should have this kind of privacy and security considerations, right? So it's not only the protocol that we uh, uh, develop, uh, as well as like the people that use, that use that uh, service or that protocol, uh, maybe it's not aware of which kind of threats can have. So maybe some kind of institution like the government or some kind of university that they can do some kind of uh, helping to the to the community, to the government, to address the security issues. But actually, it's, it's, it's a very big, it's very big, and uh, it's a, through the whole uh, stakeholders. It's not only for the ITF. It's as well should I mean, if we make a protocol but nobody uses it or nobody address like uh, in a right way, this is not going to be useful. And actually, when we talk about the security in IoT. Uh, like uh, my partner said, we talk about the devices with ca different kind of constraints. So some kind of devices are not able to run all the security aspects. So we have to we have to see how can put in these small devices with this kind of constraint, like the basic security, right? Or these kind of devices are, as well are built to be autonomous. So they can they should be bootstrapped <coughs> by themselves, right? and they should connect to, for example, bootstrap server and uh, retrieve the information for connection in a secure way. So we have this kind of scenarios with constrained devices that not all can run all the security aspect, but the minimal, right? And actually when you have this kind of uh, IoT scenarios, uh, we can envision some kind of threats. Why? Be because we can say, okay, these business models, they can, this kind of device have these constraints, so we can have this kind of threats. <coughs> For example, like two years ago, this kind of uh, attack that uh, IoT devices made, like the negation of service, right? We, we never thought, oh, this kind of device, like uh, for one euro we can get, is kind of let a server down, right? So this kind of new business things or business model of um, operation or function bring some kind of problems or threats that we have to consider and address, right? So therefore we can envision these kind of threats. Okay. In fact, it was an interesting question you asked. Who, who are the questions addressed to? Well, for example, what we have tried to do is try to get consumer organizations into this session plainly impossible because they didn't know what the IGF was. If they explained it to them, well, this is a very technical topic, what have we got to do with it, and we, we don't have the money to travel. So in other words, I think that consumer organizations could have a special role in this sort of discussions, but 
they, there has to be some significant reach out towards them to make sure that they're, they're here in 2019 and here being Berlin, of course. But that will probably go for, for other organizations as well that you would like to interact with as a technical community. I'll take one more question and then we go to the final session of the, of the, of the, of the final part of this session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm Ethan. I'm a UFA IGF fellow. Um, so I know we've talked a lot about consolidation this session, and I would be very bad of me to not continue that. <laughs> um, so I think that this is going to be one of the biggest changes to the internet architecture, and it's sort of a snowball effect that as we've gone further on and on and on, this consolidation has become more intense and more intense. Um, one area I'd like to talk about a bit about that is um, standards. So. Internet standards are increasingly, I think, either being directly being taken from the, uh, these consolidated private companies or they are being um, de facto invalidated by them. So, for example, for both of those, so HTTP2 with the uh, server push, um, I know that before that uh, Google came out with Speedy, which was a um, standard that did quite a lot of the same thing. And then let's just keep it to the same standard, for example. So um, when the IETF came out with HTTP2, there was, as you said, a big debate about whether this should include TLS in the stack. And the answer was no. But then nowadays, to de facto use HTTP2, you have to use TLS because the vendors have come together and said, you know what, we're going to decide that um, TLS is going to be mandatory. So um, my overarching um, wonder with this is that in the future, are we going to see more and more um, these consolidated players being able to sort of exert what they want to happen onto the internet community as a whole? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is John, um, coming from Civil Society, uh, the IO Foundation. I got basically two questions. They don't <clears throat> they may not need a, a, an answer, but at least I want to, to throw them. Uh, so um, how do government feel uh, how we uh, try it, uh, or are we testing them on how do they feel about increasing encryption communications uh, if we are, have this tendency of trying to encrypt even the headers of the, uh, of the communication we're going to be um, sending to applications? And um, do we suspect that we're going to fall into any sort of compromise um, situation eventually where they will, you know, ask uh, by law to actually have uh, backdoors and, and whatnot? And uh, the second question would be uh, how do we face a problem that uh, we don't have control over the hardware over which those protocols is being run. Thank you. Uh, I'll go first. So, uh, so I find this narrative about standards to be really fascinating because I started participating in standards about 10 years ago, and I remember when I um, uh, first came into it, somebody told me um, was talking to me about the routing protocols, which I didn't know anything about, and they said, "Well, basically, what happens is that." Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Cisco comes in with something that they want to do and Juniper comes in with something that they want to do and they kind of duke it out and whoever wins, that's what we rubber stamp. That's what happens with the routing protocols. Um, and if you look at the history of routing, uh, it's, it's very consolidated, right? There's not historically been very many vendors um, in the routing space. And so I have no idea if that was true at the time or, um, or, or prior to that, but that was sort of the narrative that was being told at the time. Um, so I always find it interesting when people say, well, now it's like there's, there's such a small number of players and you have these like four or five browsers or vendors and if they all get together and decide if they want to do something then like that's how it is for the web and it's like well four or five is a lot more than two so I don't know it depends on how you look at it right um, but but even there I don't I don't fully buy the narrative because I think if you look at what happened with HTTP2 um, yes there was speedy and speedy came in and it got changed it wasn't a rubber stamping effort and there was a huge amount of involvement from uh, people on the server side people from the uh, the mobile space um, who were who were deeply deeply involved like building implementations along Side uh, the, the standardization process and running interop tests and trying to make sure that um, when we when we fixed this thing in the standard that it was going to provide the features that they wanted it to provide. Now, as is tr traditional for the consensus process, not everybody was happy at the end of the day. Um, and it is true that when you know if, if the browsers all get together and decide they're going to support a feature or not support a feature, that tends to um, be definitional in terms of um, what exists on the web. Um, but what but we try to sort of set the playing field and not like um, force that 
to happen necessarily, and there's plenty of cases where that, that doesn't happen. And the same thing is happening with Quick. So there's a different version of Quick, which is called GQuick, um, which had entirely different cryptography originally, um, when, which was widely deployed by Google, right? Google, who owns uh, the client side on Android and Chrome, and who owns the server side on YouTube and Google.com and all the other properties. And it has changed dramatically in the process of standardization because the whole point of bringing it into a standards organization like the IETF was to get outside input. And now we have that from many, many other players. Um, so I think it's actually a pretty vibrant space in terms of, of input. Um, and it might be useful to kind of compare it historically and see if it's better or worse um, rather than, than kind of um, judge it right now. I think um, on, the, on the encryption question, um, Governments are not monolithic, and so I think if you ask a, um, a cybersecurity agency or a homeland security agency um, or an intelligence agency how they view the, the encryption trend on the internet, you might get a very different answer than if you um, ask a law enforcement agency um, uh, or potentially a legislator. Uh, you know, people just have different, they're, they're oriented differently towards what, they, what their view of the problem is. Um, and it's certainly the case that um, more uh, encryption in the transmission, um, as, as we've been talking about all day, uh, uh, changes the dynamic in terms of where access to information in clear text can be obtained. So it means that if you are accustomed to going to a network operator to get certain information, now you might have to go to the endpoints to get it. Um, and that's, that's certainly a shift. But I think there's not really like a uniform view about this um, based on where you might sit um, in, in government. And now I've completely forgotten the last question, which hopefully someone else will answer. <laughs> I think I've also forgotten it, but um, so so on the standardization question, I, I think the like we should not look into this as like you know can we prevent the big guys from standardizing things because those things like the encryption thing as Alyssa explained it like it's a really useful feature and and it, it improves the performance improves the security that that's not the thing that we should try and block um, so you will always have the situation where people with uh, resources will come up with technology and, and push it. I, I think she's right that the, at the IETF, there's, a f you know, at least for these cases like, you know, TLS or or uh, Quick and, and HTTP2, there's been a huge amount of people involved in the in the effort, uh, and not just the, the guys who originally came up with, you know, some of the basics. But I, I think we should be looking at, like, what other things we should should be doing. Just take a very silly example, the dough thing, and, and uh, that's sort of kind of easy to explain um, example um, but you know may, maybe that like the, there's tons of other examples that we should also be talking about I'll just take one example so it doesn't seem like an impossible task where my researcher had that you could diffuse the information uh, obfuscate the information when, when you send a question somebody to somebody and and uh, you know not create this huge data store of like who asked for what um, I think that's possible we should look into that R rather than block somebody from doing Dough. Um, and then uh, one comment on this encryption thing, of course the governments care. I forget to say uh, er earlier one thing that I, I wanted to add to what, what Alisa was saying, and, and th that was that like we had this big change where we went from 30 to 70 percent, or, or, or m my numbers actually are, uh, 20 to 80 percent, and are inching towards 100. But, but there's a, a separate change uh, brought on by I guess Doe and similar techniques, and then uh, something called encrypted SNI, which is you know tiny little thing inside TLS. Um, but it, you know those two actually prevent information uh, about like wh where is this connection going to, and that's going to have further impact. So we should not think that ah like this encryption already chain happened, and and now we have encrypted internet. That's not en entirely true. But it might actually be true in, in uh, two or three years. Thank you. We are moving into the final part of this session, just to come up with some recommendations on how to continue a discussion like this. As we have seen, there's lots of different sort of interests in this room with lots of different sort of questions coming to the technical community. And I think that's the right thing that is coming out of this session to show that the interest for interaction is there. But how can we actually make sure that <coughs> policymakers are aware of the work that's going on and that they actually make decisions based on that work? How we can make sure that consumer organizations, when they test products, are aware of the possibilities that are being offered from the technical community? How do politicians make decisions that are being put to them, but that they actually know what's behind 
those decisions? And how do we do that sort of reach out and where do we start? And I see people nodding yes. But what would be the recommendations as a next step? Say we're in Berlin next year, what sort of session should we be having then to continue this, this debate? And I'll start with what you've learned and then move to the room. And maybe we can go up for five minutes because there's nobody coming into the room at 30.20. So but that's up to you. So who would like to respond first? What, what would be the next step? So, I mean, I think that a session like this is useful because you get, um, you know, a particular variety of people in the room here, but um, I don't really view this as like a once a year kind of engagement, and that's not how we view it in the IETF. So um, we have a bunch of different um, initiatives around uh, both exposing our work to the broader world and also um, bringing people into our fold so that they can understand it better. Um, the Internet Society hosts a um, policy guests program um, led by the fearless um, Constantinos over here. And, um, and that brings uh, uh, officials from governments and policymakers um, to the IETF uh, meetings uh, three times a year uh, where they get essentially a crash course on um, all things IETF. And many of the, the trends that we've been talking about today are um, our topics of discussion there. Um, so that's, um, that's a way uh, not to, you know, uh, assume that policymakers will become um, dedicated participants in the ITF community, but for them to be able to go back to their um, home countries and home governments and spread the word about what it is that, that we're doing and, and what the trends are. Um, and uh, we have some more kind of informal outreach that we do to, as I said earlier, um, the operator communities and um, research community um, who we bring in in different ways for different kinds of workshops so that people can um, get up to speed and cross-pollinate and and um, and learn more about what we do on the consumer the consumer organizations is an interesting one because it's not one that we've uh, that the IETF uh, really directly engages with very much um, in part because we sort of put the standards out there and then um, you know hope that they get deployed and implemented and then I think a lot of the consumer organizations are on the far end of that doing testing and and um, and certification and that's a space that we uh, unlike other standards organizations which do their own certification programs um, and, and testing of, of implementations, that's not something that we've traditionally done in the IETF, so that's um, a bit of a gap. Thanks very much. Uh, it's Taylor Bentley again from the Government of Canada. So, um, yeah, and I've been writing <laughs> quite a bit of notes, and this, this group therapy has helped, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're here to provide. <laughs> The, the key is empathy, and I'm, I'm really uh, I'm sorry that the fellow from the Swiss IGF left because we f it feels fast when we don't know what's going on. And um, you, you can't trust someone that you've never met, or it's very difficult to. Um, so it's, you know, keeping that conversation going and keeping that, uh, that familiarity and that empathy strong. Now this is where we get um, consolidation and convergence to work for us because thankfully there aren't many competing standards organizations or, well not standards, but uh, direct competitors with the ITF. Uh, actually, no, sorry, there are. Um, but uh, we get that consolidation to work by supporting people to come in. Um, we grow our networks, we, we make that um, as effective and robust and, and uh, I guess think as, as big as possible, right? Uh, Google supports a lot of these initiatives and you know they all have community building budgets. Uh, so we get that to work for us. The difficulty of course is making sure that we're all kind of uh, writing the same narrative um, and kind of speaking the same language. And uh, Alyssa was really struck by what you're saying that we've been doing this for a long time uh, and we're just kind of getting our groove, right? We're, we're kind of making it work, and we're still doing that with collaboration and empathy. Uh, so that's going to take some time, but I think we'll find our groove eventually. Thank you. Uh, Arda, would you like to add something from a political point of view, from a politician's point of view? Yes. yes? That works. Okay, thank you for asking. Because in the beginning you asked, are there technicians here? Is there government here? You didn't ask, are there politicians here? Right? Okay. So there are two of us. Great. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, I think this is a very important subject for politicians, actually, because um, I would like to, to look at it at the same 
way as we're now looking at the climate change problem, that kind of came upon us as well, and now we're in the middle of a lot of problems, so we have to solve that. And the same thing could happen if we don't do the right thing now on the internet. I think we already are in a little bit of problem, that's why we're all talking here. So. Um, I, I also think that there's a, there is a responsibility of politicians, but not without the IETF letting to do the job the, the way she's doing that, because that's the nice thing that we have about our community, that we do it on consensus and talking to each other. However, there is a problem with the fact that we don't have all parties at the table, and I think that's something where politicians can help by giving funding, by uh, providing whatever is needed for you to do your job. For that, actually, they do need to understand what is that job and why is it important. And uh, as soon as it comes to technical things, the politicians tend to go like, okay, it's way too difficult, which is really strange because we don't say the same things about the noise uh, an airplane makes. It means in my country, we know everything about the decibels and the things that happens, or we know everything about the, uh, the different kind of concrete we have or buildings. But when it comes to internet, we go like, oh, what's this? <laughs> so, Wouter, I would like to take, to take up this challenge and maybe it's something we could do in the next coming years uh, to organize a meeting in our parliament on this subject and try to get some politicians there and well, juice up the subject and try to make them understand what it is the IETF is doing and why it's important and why they should be involved one way or the other. So that would be my offer to you and I hope maybe some more colleagues of me in other parliaments can pick this up. There's another organization I'm thinking of, this is the Interparliamentarian Union, IPU, which has the parliamentarians all over the world in them. They sometimes do some things with tech, but that's more about, you know, uh, fake news and stuff like that, but this could be an item there too, and I could see if I could get it in. So, yeah. I'm Julie Ward, I'm a member of the European Parliament. Um, so, I just want to back up what you say. Sorry, we never met before, but we have met before. There you go, I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> um, there's also um, a really great organization called Parliamentarians for Global Action. It's a membership organization, and it works on issues of human rights and democracy. Um, so they, uh, in a kind of macro way, um, and it's been very effective uh, in dealing with some, so it really, tar it really focuses and targets on specific issues. Um, so certainly in the European Parliament, we have a small caucus of people who are members of um, PGA, but we've been able to be very effective when other ways of getting people on board were not. So I just, um, I can give you introduction to the PGA Secretariat. I think uh, they might be open for uh, some new projects. Um, I think that would be useful. Um, I just want to, I heard somebody, I, and I'm sorry I wasn't here for the whole discussion, but I, when I came in I heard somebody saying, oh, everybody's connected, everybody can get online, we can all talk to each other. Well, can I tell you that's not true, okay? Um, there are many people who are still not connected. It's still not, f f it's still not an equal, a level playing field for everybody. In many remote areas, people don't have access. They don't have access for a lot of different reasons. And so there's a massive digital uh, divide still. Um, and also people with um, disabilities, with, um, you know, they also are not always in a situation where they're given equal access. And some of the best workshops that happen here at IGF are run by the disability community. And actually, because they're so shut out of things, they're the innovators. They're the people who are doing the most amazing things that all of us will benefit from. But I don't see any of them in the room. Okay, so we missed out here. They had a fantastic event last night called Disco Tech. They're running brilliant workshops tomorrow morning. I learned more from going to their workshops and engaging with their community in terms of making better legislation in the European Parliament than I would have done if I'd just talked to you guys, okay? So I think you're missing a trick here. And now I have to go to Youth IGF, which is my other big thing, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other suggestions like we just heard in the way that we can reach out to each other. Deep silence. Last words from ISOC as co-organizer. Sorry, just, yes? 
just to plus one the diversity um, issue, um, especially like there are the institutional barriers that exist um, that make collaboration more difficult, uh, harassment, uh, all of these things. They they need to be addressed. If they don't address, then that's poison. No one's going to want to talk to us. Thanks. It looks like people are hungry. Uh, so there, there is one thing I will say, and that is that the Internet Society actually exists partially to try to bring these conversations together. So I, I really encourage people to make sure that you hold us to it and make us do our job, uh, because that's what we're here for. Thank you. Okay, then I thank you all for being in this room. It was a lot fuller when we started, so that, but there's a lot of interest in this topic, and I think that that's the main lesson we have learned, but we also learned that there's an interest to actually reach out to each other. And for starting that, I would like to thank Ines, Yari, and Alyssa for the tremendous effort they put into this session. Thank Internet Society for making this possible. Paula for doing the remote and the scribes for doing the hard work somewhere in the world. And that is the end of this session. Thank you all very much. Thank you.